So I guess I noticed during the week from some of the questions I've been seeing that um, the idea of like what a convolution is is um, you know still a little counterintuitive or surprising to some people. So I feel like the only way I know to teach things effectively is by creating a spreadsheet. So here we are. Um, this is the famous number seven uh, from lesson zero, um, and I just copied and pasted the numbers into a spreadsheet. They're not all exactly zero, they're actually um, floats, just rounded off. And uh, as you can see, I'm just using uh, conditional coloring, um, and it kind of, you can see the shape of our little number seven here. Um, so I wanted to show you exactly what a convolution does. So, and specifically uh, what a convolution does uh, in a deep learning neural network. So we are generally using a kind of modern convolutions, and that means a three by three convolution. So here is a three by three convolution. Okay, and I have just randomly generated nine random numbers. Okay, so that is a filter. Right? There's one filter. Here is my second filter. It is nine more random numbers. Okay, so um, this is what we do in um, in Keras when we ask for a convolutional layer. We tell it we pass the first thing we pass it is how many filters do we want? Okay, and that's how many of these random little random matrices do we want it to build for us? So in this case, it's as if I passed convolution two D. Uh, the first parameter would be two. And the second parameter would be 3 comma 3 because it's a 3 by 3 right and okay so what happens to this little random matrix in order to calculate the very first item it takes the sum of the let's do here the sum of the blue stuff those nine times the red stuff those nine all added together okay so let's go down here into where it gets a bit darker how does this get calculated? This is equal to these nine times these nine. And when I say times, I mean element-wise times. So the top left by the top left, the middle by the middle, and so forth. Uh, and add them all together. That's all a convolution is. So it's just, as you go through, it's we take the corresponding 3 by 3 area in the image, and we multiply each of those nine things by each of the nine, these nine things, and then we add those nine products together. That's it. That's a convolution. Okay, so there's really nothing particularly weird or confusing about it, um, and I'll make this available in class so you can have a look. Um, you can see that when I get to the top left corner, I can't move further left and up, right, because I've kind of I've reached the edge. And this is why when you do a 3 by 3 convolution without zero padding, you lose one pixel on each edge, because you can't push this 3 by 3 any further. Okay, So if we go down to the bottom left, you can see again the same thing. It kind of gets stuck in the corner. Right? So that's why you can see that my result is one row less than my starting point. Okay. So I did this for two different filters. So here's my second filter, and you can see when I uh, calculate, say, this one, it's exactly the same thing. It's these nine times each of these nine added together. And these are just nine other random numbers. Okay? So that's how we start with our first, uh, in this case, I've created two convolutional filters. And this is the output of those two convolutional filters. And they're just random at this point. So my second layer. Now my second layer is no longer enough just to have a 3x3 three three matrix. And I need a 3x3x2 three by three by tensor. Because to calculate my, let's say my top left of my second convolutional layer, I need these nine by these nine added together plus these nine by these nine added together. Because at this point, my previous layer is no longer just one thing, but it's two things. Now indeed, if our original picture was a three-channel color pic uh, picture, our very first convolutional layer would have had to have been three by three by three tensors. Okay. 
So um, all of the convolutional layers from now on are going to be 3 by 3 by number of filters in the previous layer um, convolution matrices. So here is my first, I've just drawn it like this, 3 by 3 by 2 tensor. And you can see it's taking 9 from here, 9 from here, and adding those two together. And so then for my second filter in my second layer, it's exactly the same thing. I've created two more random matrices, or one more random 3 by 3 by 2 tensor. And here again, I have those three by these, sorry, those nine by these nine sum, plus those nine by those nine sum. And that gives me that one. So that gives me my first two layers of my convolutional neural network. Then I do max pooling. Um, max pooling is slightly more awkward to do in Excel, but that's fine. We can still handle it. So here's max pooling. So max pooling is now going because I'm going to do two by two max pooling. It's going to decrease the resolution of my image by two on each axis. So how do we calculate that number? That number is simply the maximum of those four. And then that number is the maximum of those four, and so forth. So with max pooling, we end up with, um, we started, we had two filters in the previous layer, so we still have two filters, but now our filters have half the resolution in each of the x and y axes. Okay? And so then I thought, okay, we've done two convolutional layers. Oh, wait, there's a question. Yes, there's a question. Um, how did you go from one matrix to two matrices in the second layer? How did I go from one matrix to two matrices? As in, how did I go from just this one thing to these two things? Um, so the answer to that is I just created two random 3x3 three three filters. This is my first random 3x3 three three filter. This is my second random 3x3 three three filter. So each output then was simply equal to each corresponding nine element section multiplied by each other and added together. So because I had two random 3x3 three three matrices, I ended up with two outputs. So two filters means two, um, two sets of outputs. Okay. Um, all right, so now that we've got our max pooling layer, let's use a dense layer to turn it into our output. So a dense layer means that every single one of our activations from our max pooling layer needs a random weight. So these are a whole bunch of random numbers. Okay, so what I do is I take every one of those random numbers and multiply each one by a corresponding input go and add them all together. So I've got the sum product of this and this. In MNIST we would have 10 activations because we need an activation for 0, 1, 2, 3, so forth, up to 9. So for MNIST we would need 10 sets of these dense weight matrices so that we could calculate the 10 outputs. Um, if we were only calculating one output this would be a perfectly reasonable um, way to do it. So it's for one output, it's just the sum product of everything from our final uh, layer with a, a weight for everything in that final layer um, added together. Uh, so that's all a dense layer is. Uh, so really, a both dense layers and convolutional layers are, you know, kind of couldn't be easier mathematically. Um, I think the surprising thing is what happens when you then say, okay, rather than using random weights, let's calculate the derivative of what happens if we were to change that weight up by a bit, or down by a bit, and how would it impact our loss? And in this case I haven't actually got as far as calculating a loss function, but we could add over here, we could add a, um, a, a sigmoid loss, for example. 
Um, and so we can calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to every single weight in the dense layer and every single weight in all of our filters in that layer and every single weight in all of our filters in this layer. Um, and then with all of those derivatives, we can calculate how to optimize all of these weights. And the surprising thing is that when we optimize all of these weights, we end up with these incredibly powerful models, um, like those visualizations that we saw. So I, I, I kind of, I'm not quite sure where the disconnect between the kind of incredibly simple math and the outcome is. I think it might be that it's so easy, it's hard to believe that that's all it is. But I, I'm, I'm not skipping over anything. Um, that, that really is it. And so to help you really understand this, uh, I'm going to talk more about SGD. Yes, Rachel. Why would you use a sigmoid function here? Oh, um, so the, the loss function we generally use is the softmax, okay, so e to the xi divided by sum of e to the xi. Um, if it's just binary, uh, that's, that's just the equivalent of having just 1 over 1 plus e to the xi. So softmax um, in the binary case kind of simplifies into a, into a sigmoid function. That's all. Um, thank you for clarifying that question. So uh, I think this is super fun. We're going to talk about not just SGD, but um, every variant of SGD, including one invented just a week ago. Okay, so um, we've already talked about SGD. Yes, Rachel. Uh, two more questions. Does SGD happen for all layers at once? SGD happens for all layers at once. Yes, we calculate the derivative of all the weights with respect to the loss. And when have a max pool after convolution versus when not to? When to have a max pool after a convolution? Um, who knows? You know, like this is a very controversial question, and indeed some people now are saying never use max pool. Um, instead of using max pool, um, when you're doing the convolutions, um, don't do a convolution over every set of nine pixels, but instead skip a pixel each time. And so that's another way of downsampling. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, Jeffrey Hinton, who's kind of the father of deep learning, has gone as far as saying that the extremely great success of max pooling is like, has been the greatest problem deep learning has faced. Because to him, it's like, really stops us from going further. Um, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. I assume it is because he's Jeffrey Hinton and I'm not. Uh, for now, um, we use max pooling every time we're doing fine tuning um, because we need to make sure that our architecture is identical to the original VGG's author's architecture and so we have to put max pooling wherever they did. Why do we want max pooling or downsampling or anything like that? Are we just trying to look at bigger features at the input? Or? Why use max pooling at all? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that max pooling helps with translation invariance. So it basically says if this feature is here or here or here or here, I don't care. It's kind of roughly in the right spot. And so that seems to work well. And the second is exactly what you said. Every time we max pool, we end up with a smaller grid, which means that our 3x3 three three convolutions are effectively covering a larger part of the original image, which means that our convolutions can find larger and more complex features. I think they would be the two main reasons. Why? Oh, so if um, is Jeffrey Hinton cool with the idea of um, doing the skipping? Um, uh, oh, skipping the a pixel each time? So yeah, that's what I was going to say, is Jeffrey Hinton cool? I was going to be like, no, of course he's cool. <laughs> he's um, like, and why is that better? No, Jeffrey so? Hinton's not cool with that either. Jeffrey Hinton thinks that we should be using something called a capsule architecture. The problem is he hasn't invented it yet. So <sighs> we don't have an answer to this. Thanks. The capsule architecture. C A P S. U L E. So if you Google for Jeffrey Hinton capsule, uh, you can learn all about the thing that he thinks we ought to have but don't yet have. He did point out that, um, I can't remember what it was, but one of the key pieces of, of deep learning that he invented 
took like 17 years from conception to working. So like he is somebody who sticks with these things and makes it work. So is max pooling unique to image processing? Um, max pooling is not unique to image processing. It's likely to be useful for any kind of convolutional neural network. And a convolutional neural network can be used for any kind of data that has some kind of consistent ordering. So things like speech or any kind of audio uh, or some kind of consistent time series. Um, all of these things have some kind of ordering to them and therefore you can use a CNN and therefore you can use max pooling. And as we look at NLP, we will be looking more at convolutional neural networks for other data types. And interestingly, the author of Keras last week, or maybe the week before, um, uh, made the contention that perhaps it will turn out that CNNs are the architecture that will be used for every type of ordered data. Um, and this was just after one of the leading NLP researchers released a paper basically showing a state-of-the-art result in NLP using convolutional neural networks. Um, uh, so although we'll start learning about recurrent neural networks next week, uh, I have to be open to the possibility that they'll become redundant by the end of the year, but they're still interesting. Um, okay, so SGD. So we looked at the SGD intro notebook, um, but I think things are a little more clear sometimes when you can see it all in front of you. So here is basically the identical thing that we saw in the SGD notebook in Excel. Right? So um, we are going to start by creating a line. Uh, we create 29 random numbers, and then we say, okay, let's create something that is equal to 2 times x. Sorry? Uh, that is equal to 2 times x plus 30. Uh, and so here is 2 times x plus 30. Okay, so that's my um, input data. So I am trying to, again, create something that can find the parameters of a line. Now the important thing, and this is like, this is the leap, which requires not thinking too hard lest you realize how surprising and amazing this is. Everything we learn about how to fit a line is identical to how to fit filters and weights in a convolutional neural network. And so everything we learn about calculating the slope in the intercept, we will then use to let computers see. Right? And so the answer to any question which is basically why is why not? Okay? This is a function that takes some inputs and calculates an output. This is a function that takes some inputs and calculates an output. So why not? Okay. The only reason it wouldn't work would be like because it was too slow, for example. And we know it's not too slow because we tried it. You know, and it works pretty well. So everything we're about to learn um, works uh, for any kind of uh, function which um, kind of has the appropriate types of gradients, and we can talk more about that later. Um, but neural nets have the appropriate kinds of gradients. So SGD, we start with a guess. What do we think the parameters of our function are? In this case, the intercept and the slope. And with Keras, they will be randomized using the Gloro initialization procedure we learned about, which is 6 divided by n in plus n out. Uh, random numbers. But I'm just going to say, let's pretend they're just, let's assume they're both 1. Um, we are going to use very, very small mini-batches here. Our mini batches are going to be of size 1, um, basically because it's easier to do in Excel and it's easier to see. But everything we're going to see would work equally well for a mini batch of size 4 or 64 or 128 or whatever. Okay, so here's our first row, or our first mini batch. Our input is 14 and our desired output is 58. And so our guess as to our parameters are 1 and 1. And therefore our predicted y value, okay, is equal to. 1 plus 1 times 14, which is normally 15. Therefore, uh, if we're doing root mean squared error, our error squared is prediction minus actual squared. So the next thing we do is we want to calculate the derivative with respect to each of our two inputs. One really easy way to do that is to add a tiny amount to each of the two inputs and see how the output varies. So let's start by doing that. So let's add 
0 0.01 to our intercept and calculate the line and then calculate the loss squared. Okay, so this is the error if B is increased by 0 0.01. And then let's calculate the difference between the at error and the actual error and then divide that by our change, which was 0 0.01. And that gives us our estimated gradient. I'm using DE for D error DB. It should have probably been DL for D loss DB. Okay, so this is the change in loss with respect to B is negative 85.99. We can do the same thing for A. So we can add 0.01 to A, and then calculate our line, subtract our actual, take the square, and so there is our value of estimated D loss DA, subtract it from the actual loss, divide it by 0.01, and so there are two estimates as the derivative. This approach to estimating the derivative is called finite differencing. Um, and any time you calculate a derivative by hand, you should always use finite differencing to make sure your calculation was correct. You're not very li likely to ever have to do that, however, because all of the libraries do derivatives for you. And they do them analytically, not using finite derivatives. And so here are the derivatives calculated analytically. Um, which you can do by going to Wolfram Alpha and typing in your formula and getting the derivative back. Um, so this is the analytical derivative of the loss with respect to B and the analytical derivative of A, um, of the loss with respect to A. And so you can see that our analytical and our finite difference are very similar for B and they are very similar for A. So that makes me feel comfortable that we got the calculation correct. So all SGD does is it says, okay, this tells us if we change our weights by a little bit, this is the change in our loss function, we know that increasing our value of B by a bit will decrease the loss function, and we know that increasing our value of A by a little bit will decrease the loss function. So therefore, let's decrease both of them by a little bit. And the way we do that is to multiply the derivative times a learning rate, that's the value of a little bit, and subtract that from our previous guess. Okay, so we do that for A, and we do that for B, and here are our new guesses. Now we're at 1.12 and 1.01. And so let's copy them over here. 1.12 and 1.01. And then we do the same thing. And that gives us a new A and a B. And we keep doing that again and again and again. Until we've gone through the whole data set. At the end of which, we have a guess of A of 2.61 and a guess of B of 1.07. So that's one epoch. Now, um, in real life, we would be having shuffle equals true, which means that these would be randomized. Okay, so this isn't quite perfect, but apart from that, this is SGD with a mini batch size of one. So at the end of the epoch, we say, okay, this is our new slope, so let's copy 2.61 over here, okay, and this is our new uh, intercept, so let's copy 1.06 over here, and so now it starts again, okay, so we can keep doing that again and again and again, copy the stuff from the bottom, stick it back at the top, and each one of these is going to be an epoch. So I recorded a macro with me copying this to the bottom and pasting it at the top and added something that says for i equals 1 to 5 around it. And so now if I click run, it will copy and paste it five times. And so you can see it's gradually getting closer. And we know that our goal is that it should be a a equals 2 and b equals 30. So we've got as far as a equals 2.5 and B equals 1.3. So they're better than our starting point. And you can see our um, gradually improving loss function. But it's going to take a long time. Yes, Rachel? Can we still do analytic derivatives when we are using nonlinear activation functions? Um, yes, we can use analytical derivatives as long as we're using a function that has an analytical derivative, which is pretty much every useful function you can think of. 
except ones that like you can't have something which has like an if then statement in it because it kind of like jumps from here to here but even those you can approximate so like a good example would be um, uh, ReLU. So ReLU, which is max of 0, comma x, strictly speaking doesn't really have a derivative at every point, or at least not a well-defined one, because this is what this is what ReLU looks like, right? And so its derivative here is zero, and the derivative here is one. What is its derivative exactly here? Who knows, right? But the thing is, mathematicians care about that kind of thing. We don't, right? Like in real life, this is a computer, you know, and computers are never exactly anything, you know. We can either assume that it's like an infinite amount to this side or an infinite amount to this side, and who cares, right? So. As long as it has a derivative that you can calculate in a meaningful way in practice on a computer, um, then it'll be fine. Okay, so one thing you might have noticed about this is it's going to take an awfully long time to get anywhere, right? And so you might think, okay, let's increase the learning rate. Fine, let's increase the learning rate. So let's get rid of one of these zeros. Oh dear, something went crazy. What went crazy? I'll tell you what went crazy. Our A's and B's started to go out into like 11 million, which is not the correct answer. So how did it go ahead and do that? Well, here's the problem. Let's say this was our the shape of our loss function. And this was our initial guess. Right? And we figured out the derivative is going this way. Okay? Well, actually the derivative is positive, so we want to go the opposite direction, right? And so we step a little bit over here. And then, okay, that leaves us to here, and we step a little bit further, and that leads us to here. And this looks good, right? But then we increase the learning rate, right? So rather than stepping a little bit, we stepped a long way. And that put us here. And then we stepped a long way again. And that put us here, right? If your learning rate's too high, you're going to get worse and worse. And that's what happened, okay? So getting your learning rate right is uh, critical to getting your thing to train at all. And sometimes called exploding gradients. Exploding gradients, yeah, or you can even have gradients that do the opposite. But I mean, exploding gradients is something a little bit different, but it's just kind of it's a similar idea. Um, so it looks like 0.0001 is the best we can do, and that's a bit sad because this is really slow. So let's try and improve it. So one thing we could do is to say, well, Given that every time we've been, actually let me do this in a few more dimensions. Um, so let's say we had a three-dimensional set of axes now, and we kind of had a loss function that looks like this kind of valley. And let's say our initial guess was somewhere over here. Right? So over here, the gradient is pointing in this direction. Right? So we might make a step and end up there. And then we might make another step which would put us there. And another step that would put us there. And this is actually the most common thing that happens in neural networks. Something that's kind of flat in one dimension like this is called a saddle point. And it's actually been proved that the vast majority of the space of a loss function in a neural network is pretty much all saddle points. Right? You can so, also think of it as looking like a valley. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you look at this, it's pretty obvious what should be done, which is if we go to here and then we go to here, we can say, well, on average, we're kind of obviously heading in this direction, especially when we do it again. We're obviously heading in this direction. So let's take the average of how we've been going so far and do a bit of that. And that's exactly what momentum does. And there's a question. Yes. Um, if ReLU isn't the cost function, why are we concerned with its differentiability? We care about the derivative of the output with respect to the inputs. The inputs are the filters, and remember the loss function consists of a function of a function of a function of a function. So it is um, categorical cross-entropy loss 
apply to softmax, apply to ReLU, apply to the dense layer, apply to max pooling, apply to ReLU, apply to convolutions, etc., etc. So in other words, to calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to the inputs, you have to calculate the derivative through that whole function. And this is what's called backpropagation, right? With backpropagation, it's easy to calculate that, de calculate that derivative because we know that from the chain rule, a derivative of a, of a function of a function is simply equal to the product of the derivatives of those functions. So in practice, all we do is we calculate the derivative of every layer with respect to its inputs, and then we just multiply them all together. And so that's why we need to know the derivative of the activation layers as well as the loss layer and everything else. Okay, so here's the trick. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, every time we take a step, oh, let's go back to our red, every time we take a step, we're going to also calculate the average of the last few steps. So after these two steps, the average is this direction. So the next step, we're going to take our gradient step as usual, and we're going to add on our average of the last few steps. And that means that we end up actually going to here. And then we do the same thing again. So we find the average of the last few steps, and it's now even further in this direction. And so, what, what is that surface? This is the surface of the loss function with respect to some of the parameters. In this case, just a couple of parameters. It's just an example of what a loss function might look like. So this is the loss, and this is some weight number one, and this is some weight number two. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to kind of get our little if you can imagine this is like gravity, we're trying to get this little ball to travel down this valley as far down to the bottom as possible. And so the trick is that we're going to keep taking a step, not just the gradient step, but also the average of the last few steps. And so in practice, this is going to end up kind of going donk, 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 donk. Right? That's the idea. So to do that in Excel is pretty straightforward. Um, to make things simpler, I have removed the finite differencing based derivatives here, so we just have the analytical derivatives. Right? But other than that, this is identical to the previous spreadsheet. Uh, same data, same predictions, same derivatives, except we've done one extra thing, which is that when we calculate our new b, we say it's our previous b minus our learning rate times, and we're not going times our gradient, but times this cell. And what is that cell? That cell is equal to our gradient times 0.1 plus the thing just above it times 0.9. And the thing just above it is equal to its gradient times 0.1 plus the thing just above it times 0.9. Right, and so forth. So in other words, this column is keeping track of an average derivative of the last few steps that we've taken, which is exactly what we want. And we do that for both of our two parameters. So this 0.9 is our momentum parameter. So in Keras, when you use momentum, you can say momentum equals, and you say how much momentum you want. And where did that beta come from? You just pick it. So you just pick what that parameter, what do you want? Just like your learning rate, you pick it, your, moment, your momentum factor, you just you pick it. It's something you get to choose. And you choose it by trying a few and find out what works best. Um, so let's try running this. And you can see it is still not exactly zipping along. Why is it not exactly zipping along? Well, the reason when we look at it is that we know that the constant term needs to get all the way up to 30. And it's still way down at 1.5. It's not moving fast enough. Whereas the slope term moved very quickly to where we want it to be. So what we really want is we need like different learning rates for different parameters. And doing this is called dynamic learning rates. And the 
first really effective dynamic learning rate approaches have just appeared in uh, the last three years or so. Um, and one very popular one is called Adagrad, <coughs> and it's very simple. All of these dynamic learning rate approaches have the same insight, which is this. If the parameter that I'm changing, if the derivative of that parameter is consistently of a very low magnitude, then if the if the derivative of this mini batch is higher than that, then what I really care about is the relative difference between how much this variable tends to change and how much it's going to change this time around. Right? So in other words, we don't just care about what's the gradient, but is the gradient is the magnitude of the gradient a lot more or a lot less than it has tended to be recently? So the easy way to calculate the overall amount of change of the gradient recently is to keep track of the square of the gradient. So what we do with um, Adagrad is you can see at the bottom of my epoch here, I have got a sum of squares of all of my gradients. And then I have taken the square root, so I've got the root sum of squares, and then I've just divided it by the count to get the average. So this is the average of the root sum of squares of my gradients. So this number here will be high if the magnitudes of my gradients is high. And because it's squared, it will be particularly high if sometimes they're really high. So why is it okay to just use a mini batch since the surface is going to depend on what uh, what points are in your mini batch? Um, it's not ideal to just use a mini batch and we will learn about a better approach to this in a moment. But for now, let's look at this. And in fact, um, there are two approaches very related, add a grad and add a delta. And one of them actually does this for all of the gradients so far. Um, and uh, one of them uses a slightly more sophisticated approach. This approach of doing it on a mini batch by mini batch basis is slightly different to either, but it's similar enough to explain the concept. Um, that's sorry, epoch by epoch, I should say, is what I'm actually doing here. So what I do is I ca yes, Rachel. Oh, and does this mean um, for a CNN, would dynamic learning rates mean that each filter would have its own learning rate? Um, it it would mean that every parameter has its own learning rate. So this is one parameter. That's a parameter. That's a parameter. That's a parameter. Okay, and then in our dense layer. Okay, these, that's a parameter, that's a parameter, that's a parameter. So the when you go model.summary in Keras, it shows you for every layer how many parameters there are. So anytime you're unclear on how many parameters there are, you can go back and have a look at these spreadsheets, and you can also look at the Keras model.summary and make sure you understand how they, how they turn out. So for the first layer, it's going to be the um, size of your filter times the number of your filters. If it's just black, if it's just grayscale, and then after that, the number of parameters will be equal to the size of your filter times the number of filters coming in times the number of filters coming out, and then of course your dense layers will be every input goes to every output, so number of inputs times number of outputs, a parameter to the function that is calculating you know, whether it's a cat or a dog. Um, Okay, so the what we do now is we say, okay, now this, this number here, look at this, 1857. This is saying that the derivative of the loss with respect to the slope varies a lot, whereas the derivative of the loss with respect to the intercept doesn't vary much at all. So at the end of every epoch, I copy that up to here, right? And then I take my learning rate and I divide it by that. And so now, for each of my um, parameters, I now have this adjusted learning rate, which is the learning rate divided by the recent sum of squares average gradient. And so you can see that now one of my learning rates is 100 times faster than the other, than the other one. And so let's see what happens when I run this. Is there any relationship with uh, normalizing the input data? Um, no, there's not really a relationship with normalizing the input data, um, because if you're, I mean, it can help, um, but still, if your uh, inputs are of very different scales, um, 
it's still a lot more work for it to do. Um, so, so yes, it helps, but it doesn't help so much that it makes it useless. And in fact, it turns out that even with dynamic um, learning rates, um, having normal, not just normalized imports, but batch normalized um, activations is extremely helpful. And so the thing about when you're using um, Adagrad or any kind of dynamic learning rates is generally you'll set the learning rate quite a lot higher because remember you're dividing it by this recent average. There we go. So if I set it to 0.1, oh, too far. Okay, so that's no good. So let's try 0.05. Run that. Okay, so you can see after just five steps, I'm already halfway there. Okay. Uh, another five steps, getting very close, and another five steps, oh, and it's exploded. Okay, now why did that happen? Because as we get closer and closer to where we want to be, you can see that you need to take smaller and smaller steps, right? And by keeping the learning rates the same, it meant that eventually we went too far. Okay, so this is still something you have to be very careful of. Um, all right, as more elegant, in my opinion, approach to the same thing that Adagrad is doing is something called RMS prop. And RMS prop was first introduced in Jeffrey Hinton's Coursera course. So if you go to the Coursera course uh, called Neural Networks, Neural Networks for I don't know, Jeffrey Hinton, Neural Networks Coursera, you'll find it. Um, and in one of those classes, he introduces RMS props. So it's quite funny nowadays, because this comes up in academic papers a lot, when people cite it, they have to cite Coursera course, chapter <laughs> 6, at minute 14 and 30 seconds. Um, but Hinton has asked that this be the official way that it is cited. So there you go. Um, you see how cool he is. Um, so here's what RMS prop does. What RMS prop does is exactly the same thing as momentum, okay? But instead of keeping track of the weighted running average of the gradients, we keep track of the weighted running average of the square of the gradients. So here it is, right? Everything here is the same as momentum so far, except that my I take my gradient squared, multiply it by my Point one, and add it to my previous cell times point 0.9. Okay, so this is keeping track of the recent running average of the squares of the gradients. And when I have that, I then do exactly the same thing with it that I did in Adagrad, which is to divide the learning rate by it. So I take my previous guess as to b, and then I subtract from it my derivative times the learning rate, divided by the square root of the recent running weighted average of the squared gradients. So it's doing basically the same thing as Adagrad, but in a way that's doing it kind of continuously. So these are all different types of learning rate optimization? Um, these last two are different types of dynamic learning rate approaches. Um, so let's try this one. If we run it for a few steps, and again, I'm, we'll have to guess what learning rate to start with, let's say 0.1. If anything, that's a little slow, so maybe we'll try 0.2. Oh, more. 0.2. Run. So as you can see, this is going pretty well. And I'll show you something really nice about RMS prop which is what happens as we get very close, we know the right answer is 2 and 30. Is it about to explode? No, it doesn't explode. And the reason it doesn't explode is because it's recalculating that running average every single mini-batch. And so rather than waiting until the end of the epoch, by which stage it's gone so far that it can't ever come back again, it just jumps a little bit too far, and then it recalculates the dynamic learning rates and tries again. So what happens with RMS prop is if your learning rate's too high, then it doesn't explode, it just ends up going around the right answer. And so when you use RMS prop, as soon as you see your validation uh, scores flatten out, you know this is what's going on, 
and so therefore you should probably divide your learning rate by 10. And you see me doing this all the time. When I'm running Keras stuff, you'll keep seeing me like run a few steps, divide the learning rate by 10, run a few steps. And you don't see that my loss function explodes, you just see that it flattens out. Um, so do you want your learning rate to get smaller and smaller? Yeah, you do. You need you, Your very first learning rate often has to start small, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But once you've kind of started, once you've kind of got started, uh, you generally have to gradually decrease the learning rate, and that's called learning rate annealing. And then can you repeat what you said earlier, that something does the same thing as at a grad, but... Yeah, so RMS prop, which we're looking at now, does exactly the same thing as at a grad, which is divide the learning rate by the uh, root sum of squared of the gradients. But rather than doing it since the beginning of time, or every mini-batch, or every epoch, um, RMS prop does it continuously using the same technique that we learnt from momentum, from momentum, which is take the uh, squared of this gradient, multiply it by 0.1, and add it to 0.9 times the last calculation. And that's called a moving average. Uh, it's a it's a weighted, weighted moving average. average, where we're weighting it such that the more recent squared gradients are weighted higher. I think it's actually an exponentially weighted moving average, to be more precise. So there's something pretty obvious we could do here, which is momentum seems like a good idea, RMS prop seems like a good idea, why not do both? And that is called Adam. And so Adam was invented like, I don't know, last year, 18 months ago. And hopefully one of the things you see from these spreadsheets is that like these recently invented things are still at the ridiculously extremely simple end of the spectrum, right? So like the stuff that people are discovering in deep learning is a long, 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 long way away from being like incredibly complex or sophisticated. And so hopefully you'll find this very encouraging, which is if you want to kind of play at the state of the art of deep learning, um, that's not at all hard to do, right? So let, let's look at Adam, which I remember it coming out well, I can't remember, 12, 18 months ago, and everybody was so excited because suddenly it became so much easier and faster to train neural nets. Um, but once I actually tried to create an Excel spreadsheet out of it, I realized, oh my god, it's just RMS prop to plus momentum. And so literally all I did was I copied my momentum page, and then I copied across my RMS prop columns and combined them. So you can see here I have my um, exponentially weighted moving average of the gradients. That's what these two columns that's what these two columns are. Here is my exponentially weighted moving average of the squares of the gradients. And so then when I calculate my new parameters, I take my old parameter and I subtract my um, not my derivative times the learning rate, but my momentum factor. So in other words, the, comp the recent weighted moving average of the gradients um, multiplied by the learning rate divided by the recent moving average of the squares of the derivatives, or the root of them anyway. Okay, so it's literally just combining momentum plus, um, uh, plus RMS prop. And so let's see how that goes. Let's run five epochs. And we can use a pretty high learning rate now, because it's really handling a lot of stuff for us. Wow. And five epochs, we're almost perfect. And so another five epochs, that does exactly the same thing that RMS prop does, which is it goes too far and tries to come back. All right? So we need to do the same thing when we use Atom. And Atom's what I use all the time now. Um, I just divide by 10 every time I see it flatten out. Okay? So. A week ago, somebody came out with something that they called not Adam, but Eve. And Eve is a addition to Adam, which attempts to deal with this learning rate annealing automatically. And so this, all of this is exactly the same as my Adam page. Right? But at the bottom I've added some extra stuff. I have kept track of the root mean squared error. This is just my loss function. And then I copy across my loss function from my previous epoch, 
and from the epoch before that. And what Eve does is it says, how much has the loss function changed? And so it's got this um, ratio between the previous loss function and the loss function before that. Right? So you can see it's the absolute value of the last one minus the one before, divided by whichever one's smaller. And what it says is, okay, let's then adjust the learning rate such that instead of just using the learning rate we're given, let's use the learning rate that we're given Uh, let's try to get this right. Let's adjust the learning rate that we're given by taking. Okay, so this is the next thing we do. We take the exponentially weighted moving average of these ratios. Okay, so you can see another of these betas appearing here, right? So here, this thing here is equal to our last ratio times 0.1. Sorry, our last ratio times 0.9 plus uh, our new ratio times 0.1. And so then for our learning rate, we divide the learning rate from Adam by this. Right? So you can see it's divided by F38. So what that says is if the learning rate is moving around a lot, if it's very bumpy, we should probably decrease the learning rate because it's going all over the place. Like remember how we saw before, if we've kind of gone past where we want to get to, it just jumps up and down. Okay. On the other hand, if the um, if the loss function is staying pretty constant, then we probably want to increase the learning rate. Um, so that all seems like a good idea. And so again, let's try it. Not bad, right? So after five epochs, it's kind of gone a little bit too far. Um, after a week of playing with it, I use this on State Farm a lot during the week. I grabbed a Keras implementation which somebody wrote like a day after the paper came out. Um, the problem is that because it can both decrease and increase the learning rate, sometimes as it gets down to kind of the flat bottom point where it's kind of pretty much optimal, it'll just so, it, I mean it'll often be the case that the derivative gets pretty sorry that the loss gets pretty constant at that point. And so therefore, Eve will try to increase the learning rate. And so what I tend to find happened that it would be very quickly get pretty close to the answer, and then suddenly it would jump to somewhere really awful. And then it would start to get to the answer again and jump somewhere really awful. Uh, so generally, uh, don't we, for, I mean, for the exit condition, we give a delta that the change uh, in this gradient should be, uh, if it is below certain delta, then we just stop doing that, right? We have not done any such thing, no. We have always said run for a specific number of epochs. We have not defined any kind of a stopping criterion. Um, it is possible to define such a stopping criterion, but nobody's really come up with one that's remotely reliable. And the reason why is that when you look at the graph of um, loss, over time, it doesn't tend to look like that, but it tends to look like this. Right? And so in practice, it's very hard to know when to stop. Um, it's kind of still a human judgment thing. Can't it also have lots of plateaus? Oh yeah, that's definitely true. And in particularly with um, a type of architecture called ResNet that we'll look at next week, um, the authors showed that it kind of tends to go like this. Right. So yeah, it's it's in practice you kind of have to run your training for as long as you have patience for, at whatever the best learning rate you can come up with is. Um, so something I came up with, well, something I actually came up with, uh, I'm trying to think, six or twelve months ago, but we've kind of re-stimulated my interest um, after I read this Adam paper, is something which dynamically updates learning rates in such a way that they only go down. And rather than using the loss function, which as I just said is incredibly bumpy, there's something else which is less bumpy, which is the average sum of squareds gradients. So I actually created a little spreadsheet of my idea, and I hope to prototype it in Python maybe this week or the next week after. We'll see how it goes. And the idea is basically this. Keep track of the sum of squareds of the um, derivatives, 
um, and compare the sum of squares of the derivatives from the last epoch to the sum of the squares of the derivatives of this epoch and look at the ratio of the two. Um, the derivatives should keep going down. Um, if they ever go up by too much, that would strongly suggest that you've kind of jumped out of the good part of the function. And so any time they go up too much, you should decre uh, decrease the learning rate. <coughs> so I literally added like two lines of code to my incredibly simple VBA, uh, Adam with annealing here. If the gradient ratio is greater than two, <coughs> so if it doubles, divide the learning rate by four. And here is what happens when I run that. That's five steps, another five steps. You can see it's automatically changing it, right? So I don't have to do anything. I just keep running. So I'm pretty interested in this idea. I think it's going to work super well um, because it allows me to focus on just running stuff without ever worrying about setting learning rates. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this approach to automatic learning rate annealing is something that we can have in our toolbox by the end of this course. Um, your next question. Hi. Hi. Um, one, um, one thing that happened to me today is I try a lot of different learning rates and I didn't get anywhere. Um, so, but I was working with the whole data set. Would trying with sample will actually, I'm trying to understand if, if I try with a sample and I find something, would that apply to the whole data set or how do I go about investigating this? Great question. This? Hold, hold that thought for five seconds. Was there another question at the back before we answer that one? No. Okay. So <clears throat> here is the answer to that question. The question was, it takes a long time to figure out the optimal learning rate. Um, can we calculate it using just a sample? And to answer that question, I'm going to show you how I entered state fun. <clears throat> and indeed, when I started entering state farm, I started by using a sample. And so step one was to think, okay, what insights can we gain from using a sample which can still apply when we move to the whole data set? Because running stuff in a sample took, you know, 10 or 20 seconds, and running stuff on the full data set took 2 to 10 minutes for an epoch. So, after I created my sample, which I just created randomly, <coughs> I first of all wanted to find out, well, what does it take to create a better than random model here? <coughs> Excuse me. So I always start with the simplest possible model. And so the simplest possible model has a single dense layer. Now here's a handy trick. Rather than worrying about calculating the average and the standard deviation of the input and subtracting it all out in order to normalize your input layer, you can just start with a batch norm layer. And so if you start with a batch norm layer, it's going to do that for you. So anytime you create a Keras model from scratch, I would recommend making your first layer a batch norm layer. And so this is going to normalize the data for me. Um, so that's a cool little trick, which I haven't actually seen anybody use elsewhere, but I think it's a a good default starting point all the time. If I'm going to use a dense layer, then obviously I have to flatten uh, everything into a single vector first. So this is really a minimal, most minimal model. So I tried fitting it. Uh, compiled it, fit it, and nothing happened. Not only did nothing happen to my validation, but really nothing happened to my training. It's only taking seven seconds per epoch to find this out, so that's okay. Um, so what might be going on? So I look at model.summary, and I see that there's 1.5 million parameters, and that makes me think, okay, it's probably not underfitting. It's probably unlikely that with 1.5 million parameters there's really nothing useful it can do whatsoever. It's only a linear model, true, but I still think it should be able to do something. So that makes me think that what must be going on is it must be doing that thing where it jumps too far. Right? And 
it's particularly easy to jump too far um, at the very start of training. And let me explain why. Um, it turns out that there are often <coughs> reasonably good answers that are way too easy to find. So one re reasonably good answer would be always predict zero. Because there are 10 output classes, right, in um, the state farm competition, there's one of 10 different types of distracted driving. And you are scored based on the uh, cross entropy loss. And what that's looking at is, okay, well, how accurate are each of your 10 predictions? So rather than trying to predict something well, what if we just always predict, well, not zero, let's say we always predict 0 0.01. Nine times out of ten, you're going to be right, because nine out of the ten categories, it's not that. Right? It's only one of the ten categories. So actually, always predicting 0.01 would be pretty good. Now it turns out it's not possible to do that, because we have a softmax layer. And a softmax layer, remember, is e to the xi divided by sum of e to the xi's. And so in a softmax layer, you have to, everything, everything has to add to one. So therefore, if it makes one of the classes really high, and all of the other ones really low, then nine times out of ten, it is going to be right nine times out of ten. <laughs> so in other words, it's a pretty good answer for it to always predict some random class, class eight, close to 100% certainty. And that's what happened. So anybody who tried this, and I saw a lot of people on the forums this week saying, I tried to train it, and nothing happened, and the folks who got the really interesting insight were the ones who then went on to say, and then I looked at my predictions, and it kept predicting the same class with great confidence again and again and again. Okay, that's why it did that. And I just wanted to point out that it's eight minutes till eight, so we should take a break soon. Thank you. Okay, so... Our next step then is to try decreasing the learning rate. So here is exactly the same model, but I'm now using oh, it's meant to be one Enic five, um, a much lower learning rate. And when I run that, okay, it's actually moving. Okay, so it was only 12 seconds of compute time to figure out <clears throat> that I'm going to have to start with a low learning rate. Once we've got to a point where the accuracy is, you know, reasonably better than random. We're well away from that part of the loss function now that says always predict everything is the same class, and therefore we can now increase the learning rate back up again. So generally speaking, for these harder problems, you'll need to start at an epoch or two at a low learning rate, <coughs> and then you can increase it back up again. Okay, so you can see now I can put it back up to 0.01 and very quickly increasing my accuracy. So you can see here my accuracy on my validation set is 0.5 using a linear model. And this is a good starting point because it kind of says to me any time that my validation accuracy is worse than about 0.5, this is really no better than even a linear model, so this is not worth spending more time on. One obvious question would be how do you decide how big a sample to use? And what I did was I tried a few different sizes of sample for my validation set. And I then said, okay, evaluate the model, so in other words, calculate the loss function, on the validation set, but for a whole bunch of randomly sampled batches. So do it 10 times. And so then I looked and I saw how the accuracy changed. Right? And so with the validation set set at 1,000 images, my accuracy changed from like 0.48 or 0.47 to 0.51. So it's not changing too much. It's small enough that I think, okay, I can make useful insights using a, valid, using a sample size of this size. So <clears throat> what else can we learn from um, a, uh, from a sample? Well, one is like, are there other architectures that work well? So the obvious thing to do with a computer vision problem is to try a convolutional neural network. And here's one of the most simple convolutional neural networks. Two convolutional layers, each one with a max pooling layer. And then one 
dense layer followed by my dense output layer. So again, I tried that and found that it very quickly got to an accuracy of 100% on the training set, but only 24% on the validation set. And that's because I, I was very careful to make sure my validation set included different drivers to my training set, because on Kaggle it told us that the test set has different drivers. And so it's much harder to recognize what a driver is doing if we've never seen that driver before. So I could see that convolutional neural networks clearly are a great way to model this kind of data, but I've got to have to think very carefully about overfitting. So step one to avoiding overfitting is data augmentation, <coughs> as we learned in our data augmentation class. So here's the exact same model, and I tried every type of data augmentation. So I tried shifting it left and right a bit. I tried shifting it up and down a bit. I tried shearing it a bit. I tried rotating it a bit. I tried shifting the channels, so the colors, a bit. And for each of those I tried, tried four different levels. And I found in each case what was the best. And then I combined them all together. So here were my best um, <coughs> data augmentations amounts. So on 1560 images, so a very small set, this is just my sample, I then ran my very simple two convolutional layer model with this data augmentation at these optimized parameters. And it didn't look very good. After five epochs, I only had 0.1 accuracy on my validation set. But I can see that my training set is continuing to improve. And so that makes me think, okay, don't give up yet. Try decreasing the learning rate and do a few more. And lo and behold, it started improving. Right? So this is where you've got to be careful not to jump to conclusions too soon. So I ran a few more, and it's improving well. So I ran a few more. Another 25. And look at what happened. It kept getting better and better and better. until we were getting 67% accuracy. So this 1.15 um, uh, validation loss is well within the top 50% in this competition. So using an incredibly simple model on just a sample, we can get in the top half of this Kaggle competition simply by using the right kind of data augmentation. All right? So I think this is a really interesting insight about the power of this um, incredibly useful tool. Okay, let's have a five-minute break, and uh, we'll do your question first. So, uh, can you grab the microphone? Sample of the valid, uh, the set that you can use. Can you close to your mouth as well? Uh, with you. ten classes. Ten uh, classes. Yep. Would a class imbalance affect? Uh, um, it's unlikely that there's going to be a class imbalance in my validation in my sample, unless there was an equivalent class imbalance in the real data, because I've got a thousand examples. And so just statistically speaking, that's unlikely. If there is a class imbalance in my original data, then I want my sample to have that class imbalance too. So uh, I, at this point, I felt pretty good <coughs> that I knew that we should be using um, a convolutional neural network, which is obviously a very strong hypothesis uh, to start with anyway. <coughs> and also felt pretty confident when you what, uh, what kind of learning rate to start with, and then how to change it, and also what data augmentation to do. Um, the next thing I wanted to wonder about was like, okay, how, what, how else do I handle overfitting? Because although I'm getting some pretty good results, I'm still overfitting hugely, 0.6 versus 0.9. Um, so the next thing in our list of ways to avoid overfitting, and I hope you guys all remember that we have that list in Lesson 3. Uh, the five steps. Um, let's go and have a look at it now to remind ourselves. Approaches to reducing overfitting. Okay, these are the five steps. Right. We can't add more data. We've tried using data augmentation. <coughs> We're already using batch norm and comnets. So the next step is to add regularization. And dropout is our kind of favored regularization technique. So I was thinking, okay, can we 
Actually, before we do that, I'll just mention one more thing about this data augmentation approach. Um, I have literally never seen anybody write down a process as to how to figure out what kind of data augmentation to use and the amount. Um, the only posts I've seen on it always rely on intuition, which is basically like, you know, look at the images and think about how much they seem like they should be able to move around or rotate. Um, I really tried this week to come up with a rigorous, repeatable process that you could use. Um, and that process is go through each data augmentation type one at a time, try three or four different levels of it on a sample with a big enough validation set that it's pretty stable to find the best value of each of the data augmentation parameters and then try combining them all together. Right. So um, I, I hope you kind of come away with this as, as, a, as, a, as a practical message, which you know probably your colleagues, even if some of them claim to be deep learning experts, I doubt that they're doing this. Um, so this is something you can hopefully get people into the practice of doing. Regularization, however, we cannot do on a sample. And the reason why is that step one, uh, add more data, well that step is very correlated with add regularization. As we add more data, we need less regularization. So as we move from a sample to the full data set, we're going to need less regularization. So to figure out how much regularization to use, we have to use the whole data set. So, um, so at this point I changed it to use the whole data set, not the sample, and I started using dropout. So you can see that I started with my data augmentation amounts that you've already seen, and I started adding in some dropout, and ran it for a few epochs to see what would happen, and you can see it's worked um, pretty well. So we're getting up into the 75% now, and before we were in the 64%. So I haven't checked, uh, once we add clipping, which is very important for getting the best um, cross-entropy uh, loss function. I haven't checked where that would get us on the Kaggle leaderboard, um, but I'm pretty sure it would be at least in the top third um, based on this accuracy. So I did a few more even. Let's see, how did we go? Oh, okay, so actually I ran a few more epochs with an even lower learning rate and got 0 0.78, 0 0.79. So, yeah, so this is going to be well up into the top third, maybe even the top quarter, probably the top third of the leaderboard. Um, so this is just, uh, so I got to this point by just trying out uh, a couple of different levels of dropout. Um, just, and I just put them in my dense layers. There's no rule of thumb here. Um, a lot of people put small amounts of dropout in their convolutional layers as well. All I can say is to try things. Um, but what VGG does is to put 50% dropout <coughs> after each of its dense layers, and that doesn't seem like a bad rule of thumb. So that's what I was doing here, and then trying around a few different sizes of dense layers to try and find something reasonable. Um, I didn't spend a heap of time on this, um, so there's probably better architectures, but as you can see, this is still a pretty good one. So that was my step two. Now, um, so far, we have not... Um, used a pre-trained network at all. So this is getting into kind of the top third, top third of the leaderboard without even using any ImageNet features. So that's pretty damn cool. Um, but we're pretty sure that ImageNet features would be helpful. Um, so that was the next step, was to use ImageNet features, so VGG features. Um, specifically, I was reasonably confident that all of the convolutional layers of VGG are probably pretty much good enough. I didn't expect I would have to fine-tune them much, if at all, because the convolutional layers are the things which really look at kind of the, the, the shape and structure of things, rather than how they fit together. And these are photos of the real world, just like ImageNet are photos of the real world. So I really felt like most of the time, if not all of it, was likely to be spent on the dense layers. So therefore, because calculating the convolutional layers takes nearly all the time, because that's where all the computation is, I pre-computed the output of the convolutional layers. 
And we've done this before, um, you might remember. Um, when we looked at dropout, we did exactly this. We figured out what was the last convolutional layer's um, ID, we grabbed all of the layers up to that ID, we built a model out of them, and then we calculated the output of that model, and that told us the value of those features, those activations from the from VGG's last convolutional layer. So I did exactly the same thing. I basically copied and pasted that code. So I said, okay, grab VGG16, find the last convolutional layer, build a model that contains everything up to and including that layer, <coughs> um, predict the output uh, of that model. So predicting the output means calculate the activations of that last convolutional layer. And since that takes some time, um, then save that. So I never have to do it again. Um, so then in the future I can just load that array. Okay, so this array... Okay, so I am not going to calculate those, I am simply going to load them. And so have a think about what would you expect the shape of this to be. And you can figure out what you would expect the shape to be by looking at model.summary and finding the last convolutional layer, here it is, and we can see it is 512 filters <coughs> by 14 by 14. So let's have a look, um, just one moment, and we'll find our conv val feet, conv val feet dot shape, 512 by 14 by 14, as expected. I have the box. Uh, is there a reason you chose to leave out the um, max pooling and flatten layers? Ah, so um, why did I leave out the max pooling and flatten layers? <clears throat> Basically because it takes zero time to calculate them, and um, the max pooling layer loses information. So I thought, um, given that I might want to play around with like other types of pooling or other types of convolutions or whatever, <coughs> I thought pre-calculating this layer is the last one that takes a lot of computation time. Um, having said that, the first thing I did with it in my new model was to max pool it and flatten it. Right? So yeah, it was just uh, that's the only reason. Okay. So now that I have the um, output of uh, VGG for the last conv layer, I can now build a model that has dense layers um, on top of that. And so the input to this model will be the output of those conv layers. And the nice thing is it won't take long to run this, even on the whole data set, because the dense layers don't take much computation time. So here's my model. And uh, by making P a parameter, I could change, try a wide range of dropout amounts. Um, and I fit it, and one epoch takes five seconds on the entire data set, right? So this is a super good way to play around. And you can see <coughs> one epoch gets me 0.65, three epochs gets me 0.75. <coughs> I was not coughing at all today, now I am. So this is pretty cool. I have something that in 15 seconds can get me 0.75 accuracy. And notice here, I'm not using any data augmentation. Why aren't I using data augmentation? Because you can't pre-compute the output of convolutional layers if you're using data augmentation. Because with data augmentation, your convolutional layers give you a different output every time. So that's just a bit of a bummer. Sure. You can't use data augmentation if you are pre-computing the output of a layer. Because think about it, every time it sees the same cat photo, it's rotating it by a different amount, say, or sharing it by a different amount, or moving it by a different amount. So it would give a different output of the convolutional layer, so you can't pre-compute it. Um, there is something you can do, which I played with a little bit, um, which is you could pre-compute like 
something that's like ten times bigger than your data set consisting of like ten different data augmented versions of it um, which is why I actually had this uh, where is it which is what I actually was doing here when I brought in this data generator with augmentations and I created something called data augmented convolutional features in which I predicted five times the amount of data or calculated five times the amount of data and so that basically gave me a data set five times bigger um, and that actually worked pretty well it's not as good as having a whole new sample every time but it's kind of a compromise anyway so once I played around with these dense layers um, uh, I then did some more fine-tuning um, and found out that so if I went basically here I then tried saying okay let's go through my all of my layers in my model from 16 onwards um, and set them to trainable um, and see what happens um, so I tried retraining you know fine-tuning some of the convolutional layers as well it basically didn't help okay so I, I experimented with my hypothesis and I found it was correct which is it seems that for this particular um, uh, model uh, coming up with the right set of dense layers is what it's all about yes Rachel uh, there's a question um, if we want rotational invariance should we keep the max pooling or can another layer do it as well max pooling doesn't really have anything to do with rotational invariance <clears throat> max pooling does um, um, translation invariance um, okay so I'm going to show you one more cool trick I've lot, lot, uh, well, I'm going to show you a little bit of state farm every week from now on because there's so many cool things to try um, and I want to keep reviewing CNNs because convolutional neural nets um, really are becoming what deep learning is all about I'm going to show you one really cool trick it's actually a combination of two tricks the two tricks are called pseudo labeling and knowledge distillation pseudo labeling so if you Google for pseudo labeling semi supervised learning you can see the original paper that came up with pseudo labeling um, I guess that's uh, there you go 2013 and then knowledge distillation uh, this is a Jeffrey Hinton paper distilling the knowledge in a neural network this is from 2015 okay so these are um, a couple of uh, really cool techniques which um, oh, Hinton and Jeff Dean that's not bad um, we're going to combine them together um, and they're kind of crazy what we're going to do is we are going to use the test set to give us more information because in State Farm the test set has 80,000 images in it and the training set has 20,000 images in it so why would like what could we do with those 80,000 images which we don't have labels for it seems a shame to waste them like it seems like we should be able to do something with them and there's a great little picture here <laughs> imagine we only had two points right and we knew their labels white and black and then somebody said how would you label this and then they told you that there's a whole lot of other unlabeled data right notice this is all gray right it's not labeled but it's helped us hasn't it it's helped us because it's told us how the how the data is structured Right? And this is what semi-supervised learning is all about. It's all about using the unlabeled data to try and understand something about the structure of it and use that to help you, just like in this picture. Pseudo-labeling and knowledge distillation are a way to do this. And what we do is, and, and I'm not going to do it on the test set, I'm going to do it on the validation set because it's a little bit easier to see the impact of it. Um, and maybe next week we'll look at look at the test set to see because that's going to be much cooler when you're doing the test set It's this simple what we do is we take our, our model some model. We've already built and We predict the outputs from that model for our unlabeled set in this case I'm using the validation set as if it was unlabeled so like I'm ignoring the labels and Those things we call the pseudo labels so now that we have predictions for the test set or the validation set it's not that they're true, but we can pretend they're true. 
We can say like, well, there's, there's some label. They're not correct labels, but they're labels nonetheless. So what we then do is we take our training labels and we concatenate them with our validation or test set pseudo labels. And so we now have a bunch of labels for all of our data. And so we can now also concatenate our convolutional features with the convolutional features of the validation set or test set. And we now use these to train a model. So the model we use is exactly the same model we had before, and we train it in exactly the same way as before, and our loss goes up from 0.75 to 0.82. So our error has dropped by like 25%, right? And the reason why is just because we use this additional unlabeled data to try to figure out the structure of it. Yes? There's a question about uh, model choice. Yes. How do you learn how to design a model and when to stop messing with them? It seems like you've taken a few initial ideas, tweaked them to get higher accuracy, but unless your initial guesses are amazing, there should be plenty of architectures that would also work. Okay, so if and when you figure out how to find an architecture and stop <laughs> fucking with it, please tell me, because I don't sleep. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we all want to know this, right? And like, I look back at these models I'm showing you, and I'm like thinking, like, I bet there's something like twice as good. I don't know what it is. Um, there are all kinds of ways of optimizing <coughs> other hyperparameters of deep learning. For example, there's something called Spearmint. Spearmint, the type, yes. Um, which is a Bayesian optimization hyperparameter tuning thing. Um, in fact, just last week a new paper came out for hyperparameter tuning. But this is all about like tuning things like the learning rate and stuff like that. Coming up with uh, architectures, yeah, who knows? Um, there are some um, there are some people who have tried. Uh, to come up with some kind of more general architectures, and we're going to look at one next week called um, ResNets, which are, um, seem to be pretty encouraging in that direction. But but even then, like the general question of like, okay, I'll give you an example. Um, ResNet, which we're going to learn about next week, is an architecture which was uh, which won ImageNet in 2015, and the author of ResNet, um, super smart guy, Kai Ming He. Uh, from Microsoft basically uh, said um, the reason ResNet's so great is it lets us build very 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 deep networks and uh, indeed he showed a network with over a thousand layers and it was totally state-of-the-art somebody else came along a few months ago and built wide ResNets with like 50 layers and easily beat Kaiming Her's best results so like the very author of the ImageNet winner completely got wrong the reason why his invention was good, right? So the idea that any of us have any idea how to create optimal architectures is totally, totally wrong. We, we don't. So that's why I'm trying to show you what we know so far, which is like the processes you can use to build them without waiting forever, right? So in this case, doing your data augmentation on the small sample in a rigorous way. Figuring out that probably the dense layers are where the action is at and pre-computing the input to that. Um, these are the kinds of things that can keep you sane. And I'm showing you the outcome of like my last weeks kind of playing with this. I can tell you that during this time I continually fell into the trap of running stuff on the whole network and all the way through and fiddling around with hyperparameters, hyperparameters. And like, I'd have to stop myself and have a cup of tea and say, like, okay, is this really a good idea? Is this really a good use of time? Um, so we all do it. Um, but not you anymore, because you've been to this class. <laughs> Green box. Back there. Uh, can you run us through this one more time? I'm just a little confused. Yeah. It's, it feels like maybe we're using our validation set as part of our training program and I'm confused how it's not sure. True. But look, we're not using the validation labels. Nowhere here does it say val underscore labels. So yeah, we are absolutely using our validation set. 
but we're using the validation sets inputs and For our test set we have the inputs So next week I will show you this page again and this time I'm going to use the test set I just didn't have enough time to do it this time around and hopefully we're going to see some great results And when we do it on the test set then you'll be really convinced that it's not using the labels because we don't have any labels But you can see here all it's doing is it's creating pseudo labels by calculating what it thinks it ought to be based on the model that we just built um, with that 75% accuracy and so then it's able to use the input data for the validation set in an intelligent way and therefore improve the accuracy Are the labels then which are being generated out of the project are the same as they are in the training set? What do you mean the same? So the the val pseudo yes. the contents of that will yes. be um, It will be based on what the model has learned by training on the training set. Yeah, it's using bn underscore model and bn underscore model is the thing that we just fitted by using the training labels So this is bn model it's the thing with this 0.755 accuracy So if we were to look at I, mean, I know we haven't gone through can you move a bit closer to the mic? Sure. Um, this uh, the supervised and unsupervised learning and in this case semi-supervised semi -supervised learning supervised yeah. learning Right, and semi-supervised works because you're giving it a, a model which already knows about a bunch of labels, hmm. but unsupervised wouldn't know. Unsupervised has nothing. That's right. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I wasn't particularly thinking about doing this, but um, so if I uh, so unsupervised learning is where you're trying to build a model when you have no labels at all. Um, how many people here would be interested in hearing about uh, unsupervised learning during this class? Okay, enough people. I should do that. All right, I will. I will add it. Uh, during the week, perhaps we can create a forum thread about unsupervised learning, and I can learn about what you're interested in doing with it, um, because many things that people think of as unsupervised problems actually aren't. Uh, okay, so pseudo labeling is insane um, and awesome, and we need the green box back. Okay, and there are a number of questions. Okay. Um, uh, so one is uh, earlier you talked about learning about the structure of the data mm. that you can learn from the validation <clears throat> set. Can <clears throat> you say more about that? I don't know. Not really. Um, other than that picture I showed you before with the two little spirally things. Um, and that picture was kind of showing how they clustered in a way yeah. that was higher dimension than what yeah. you could see when you just had two points. Right. So think about that, that Matt Zeiler paper we saw or the Jason Yasinski visualization toolbox we saw. The, the layers learn you know, uh, shapes and textures and concepts. Um, in that 80,000 test images of people driving in different distracted ways, th there are lots of concepts there to learn about ways in which people drive in distracted ways, even although they're not labeled. So what we're doing is we're trying to learn better convolutional or dense features. Um, that's what I mean by learning more. So, so the structure of the data here is basically like, what do these pictures tend to look like? Um, more importantly, in what ways do they differ? Because it's the ways that they differ that therefore must be Related to how they're labeled Okay um, uh, Can you use your updated model to make new labels um, for the validation? Yes, set? you can absolutely do pseudo labeling on pseudo labeling and and you should um, and If I don't get sick of running this code, I will try it next week Could um, that introduce bias towards your validation set? No, because we don't have any validation labels <laughs> Um, one of the tricky parameters in pseudo labeling is in each batch How many how much do I make it a mix of training versus pseudo? Um, and one of the big things that stopped me from Getting the test set in this week is that um, Keras doesn't have a way of creating batches which have like 80% of this set and 20% of that set which is really what I want because if I just Pseudo labeled the whole test set and then concatenated it then f like 80% of my 
batches are going to be pseudo labels. And generally speaking, the rule of thumb I've read is that somewhere around a quarter to a third of your mini batches should be pseudo labels. So I need to find, like, write some code basically to get Keras to generate batches which are a mix from two different places um, before I can do this properly. And then there are two questions that I think are asking the same thing. Um, are your pseudo labels only as good as the initial model you're beginning from? So do you need to have kind of a particular accuracy? In yeah, your, your pseudo labels then? are indeed as good as your model you're starting from. Um, people have not studied this enough to know how sensitive it is to those initial to those initial um, labels. Um, is there a rule of thumb about what accuracy level? No, this is too new, you know, and um, just try it, you know. I, my, my guess is that pseudo labels will be useful regardless of what accuracy level you're at because it'll make it better. As long as you are in a semi-supervised learning context, i.e. you have a lot of unlabeled data that you want to take advantage of. Okay, um, I really want to move on because um, I told you I wanted to get us down the path to NLP this week. And it turns out that the path to NLP, strange as it sounds, starts with collaborative filtering. You will learn why next week. This week we are going to learn about collaborative filtering. And so collaborative filtering is a way of doing recommender systems. And uh, I sent you guys an email today with a link to more information about collaborative filtering and recommender systems, so please read those links if you haven't already, just to get a sense of like what the problem we're solving here is. Um, in short, what we're trying to do is to learn to predict who is going to like what and how much. For example, the one million dollar Netflix price. How much, at what, what rating level will this person give this movie? Um, if you're writing Amazon's recommender system to figure out what to show you on their homepage, which products is this person likely to rate highly? Um, if you're trying to figure out what stuff to show on a news feed, which articles is this person likely to enjoy reading? There's a lot of different ways of doing this, but broadly speaking there are two main classifications of recommender system. One is based on metadata, which is, for example, this guy filled out a survey in which they said they liked action movies and sci-fi. And we also have taken all of our movies and put them into genres, and here are all of our action sci-fi movies, so we'll use them. Broadly speaking, that would be a metadata-based approach. A collaborative filtering based approach is very different. It says, let's find other people like you and find out what they liked and assume that you will like the same stuff. And specifically when we say people like you, we mean people who rated the same movies you've watched in a similar way. And that's called collaborative filtering. It turns out that in a large enough data set, collaborative filtering is so much better than the metadata-based approaches that adding metadata doesn't even improve it at all. So when people in the Netflix prize actually went out to like IMDB and stuff like that and sucked in additional data and tried to use that to make it better, at a certain point it didn't help. Right? Once their collaborative filtering models were good enough, it didn't help. And that's because it's something I learned about 20 years ago when I used to do a lot of surveys and consulting. It turns out that asking people about their behavior is crap compared to actually looking at people's behavior. So let me show you what collaborative filtering looks like. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a data set called MovieLens. So you guys hopefully will be able to play around with this this week. Unfortunately, um, Rachel and I could not find any Kaggle competitions that were about recommender systems and where the competitions were still open for entries. So we're going to use a... Yes, I was just say Kaggle has a lot of metadata heavy um, recommendation yeah, boring. Um, however, there is something called Movie Lens, which is a widely studied data set in academia. Perhaps surprisingly, um, approaching or beating an academic state of the art is way easier than winning a Kaggle competition. Because in Kaggle competitions, 
lots and lots and lots of people look at that data and they try lots and lots and lots of things and they use a really pragmatic approach, whereas academic state of the arts are done by academics. So, um, with that said, the movie lens benchmarks are going to be much easier to beat than any Kaggle competition, but it's still interesting. Um, so you can download movie lens data set from the movie lens data set website. And you'll see that there's one here recommended for new research with 20 million items in. Um, also conveniently, they have a small one with only 100,000 ratings. So you don't have to build a sample, they have already built a sample for you. So I am, of course, going to use a sample. So what I do is I read in ratings.csv. And as you'll see here, I've started using pandas. PD is PD for pandas. How many people here have tried pandas? Awesome. Okay, so those of you that don't, hopefully the peer group pressure is kicking in. All right, so pandas is a great way of dealing with structured data and you should use it. Um, reading a CSV file is this easy. Showing the first few items is this easy. Finding out how big it is, finding out how many users and movies there are, are all this easy. Um, I wanted to play with this, of course, in Excel, because that's the only way I know how to teach. So. Um, what I did was I grabbed the um, the uh, user ID by rating and grabbed the top 15 most uh, busiest movie watching users and then I grabbed the 15 most watched movies and then I created a cross tab of the two and then I copied that into Excel. Here is The table I downloaded from MovieLens for the 15 busiest movie watching users and the 15 most widely watched movies. And here are the ratings. Here's the rating of mover, user 14 for movie 27. Look at these guys. These three users have watched every single one of these movies. I'm probably one of them. I love movies. Um, <clears throat> wow, and these have been watched by every single one of these users. So. Uh, user 14 kind of liked movie 27, loved movie 49, hated movie 51. Um, so let's have a look. Is there anybody else here? Okay, so this guy really liked movie 49, didn't much like movie 57, so they may feel the same way about movie 27 as that user. That's the basic essence of collaborative filtering. Okay, but we're going to try and automate it a little bit. And the way we're going to automate it is we're going to say, well, let's pretend for each movie we had like five characteristics, which is like, is it sci-fi? Is it action? Uh, is it dialogue heavy? Is it new? Um, and does it have Bruce Willis? All right? And then we could like have those five things for every user as well. Right? Which is 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 this uh, user? Oops, I put across one. Is this user somebody who likes sci-fi, action, dialogue, new movies, and Bruce Willis? All right. And so what we could then do is multiply those metric. Actually, I shouldn't say multiply matrix product or dot product that set of user features <coughs> with that set of movie features. If this person likes sci-fi and it's sci-fi and they like action and it is action and so forth then a high number will appear in here for this matrix product of these two vectors, this dot product of these two vectors. Um, and so this would be a cool way to build up a collaborative filtering system if only we could create these five items for every movie and for every user. Now because we don't actually know what five things are most important for users, and what five things are most important for movies, we are instead going to learn them. And the way we learn them is the way we learn everything, which is we start by randomizing them, and then we use gradient descent. So here are five random numbers for every movie, and here are five random numbers for every user, and in the middle is the dot product of that movie with that user. Once we have a good set of movie factors and user factors for each one, <coughs> then each of these ratings 
will be similar to each of the observed ratings. And therefore this sum of squared errors will be low. Currently, it is high. So we start with our random numbers, we start with a, a, a loss function of 40. So we now want to use gradient descent, um, and it turns out that every copy of Excel has a gradient descent solver in it, so we're going to go ahead and use it. It's called solver. And so we have to tell it what thing to minimize, so it's saying minimize this, and which things do we want to change, which is all of our factors, and then we set it to a minimum and we say solve. And then we can see in the bottom left it is trying to make this better and better and better using gradient descent. Notice I'm not saying stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent means it's doing it many batch at a many batch time. Gradient descent means it's doing the whole data set each time. Excel uses gradient descent, not stochastic gradient descent. They give the same answer, right? But um, you might also wonder why is it so damn slow? It's so damn slow because it doesn't know how to create analytical derivatives, so it's having to calculate the derivatives with finite differencing, which is slow. Okay, so here we got a solution. It's got it down to five. That's pretty good. So we can see here that it predicted 5.14 and it was actually 5. It predicted 3.05 and it was actually 3. <clears throat> so it's done a really, really good job. Um, it's a little bit too easy because there are five times that many user factors and uh, movie factors and five times that many user factors. We've got nearly as many factors as we have things to calculate. Okay, so it's kind of overspecified, but the idea is there, right? There's one piece missing. Uh, the piece we're missing is that some users probably just like movies more than others, and some movies are probably just more liked than others. And this dot product does not allow us in any way to say this is a enthusiastic user or this is a popular movie. To do that we have to add bias terms. So here is exactly the same spreadsheet but I have added one more row to the movies part and one more column to the users part for our biases, and I have updated the formula so that as well as the matrix multiplication, it also is adding the user bias and the movie bias. So this is saying this is a very popular movie, and here we are. This is a very enthusiastic user, for example. And so now that we have a collaborative filtering plus bias, we can do gradient descent on that. So previously our gradient descent um, loss function was 5.6. We would expect it to be better with bias because we can really better specify what's going on. Let's try it. So again, we run solver, solve. And we let that zip along, and we see what happens. So these um, things we're calculating are called latent factors. A latent factor is some factor that is influencing the outcome, but we don't quite know what it is. We're just assuming it's there. right? And in fact, what happens is when people do collaborative filtering, they then go back and they like draw graphs where they say, okay, this, here are the movies that are scored highly on this latent factor and low on that late, late, latent factor, and so they'll discover the Bruce Willis factor, and the sci-fi factor, and so forth. And so if you look at the Netflix Prize visualizations, you will see these, these graphs people do. And the way they do them is they literally do this, not in Excel, because they're not that cool, but they, they do these, um, they calculate these latent factors, and then they draw pictures of them, and then they actually write the name of the movie on the graph. Anyway, 4.6, even better. Okay, So you can see that, um, ah, that's interesting. In fact, I also have an error here, because any time that my um, rating is empty, um, I really want to be setting this to empty as well, which means my parenthesis was in the wrong place. 
So I am going to recalculate this <coughs> with my error fixed up and see if we get a better answer. No, nope, not really. It's sticking there at 4.58. Worth a try. Uh, green box, please. Okay, I'm going to throw this higher this time. <laughs> Um, where did the I I may have forgotten or missed this? Where did the movie factors come or the yeah the movie factors come from? They're random. They're random. Yeah, they're randomly yeah. generated and then optimized with gradient descent. All right. For some reason, this this seems crazier than uh, what we were doing at CNNs. Cause, wow, because yeah, that was pretty crazy. This is even crazier. I, I think this is because like I actually you know like movies I understand more than like. Features of images that okay. I just don't intuitively understand. So okay, um, so um, we can look at some pictures next week. But during the week, um, Google for Netflix Prize visualizations, and you will see these pictures. And and it really does work the way I described. It figures out, you know, what are the most interesting dimensions on which we can rate a movie, and things like level of action and sci-fi and dialogue driven are very important features it turns out um, Yeah, but rather than pre-specifying those features we have definitely learned from this class that Calculating features using gradient descent is going to give us better features than trying to engineer them by hand um, Yeah, anyway um, Interesting that it feels crazy uh, Tell me next week if you find some particularly interesting things or if it still seems crazy and we can try to decrazify it a little bit um, Okay, so let's um, do this in Keras Now there's really only one um, main new concept we have to learn which is we started out with data not in a cross tab form but in This form we have user ID movie ID rating triplets Okay, and I cross tab them. Oh. So the rows and the columns um, above the, the random numbers are they then the variations in all the features in the movies and the fe variations and features in the in the users? Yeah, each of these rows is one feature of a movie, and each of these columns is one feature of a user, and so one of these sets of five. It's one set of features for a user. This is this user's latent factors. I think it's interesting and crazy because you're basically taking random data and you can generate those features out of people that you don't know and movies that you're not looking at. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, this is the this is the thing I said at the start of class, which is there's nothing um, mathematically complicated about gradient descent. The hard part is unlearning the idea that this should be hard. You know, gradient descent just figures it out. Did you have a question? I, uh, one question behind you. Well, can I make a comment yeah. first? I just wanted to um, also point out that this you can think of as a um, spark or smaller, more concise way to represent the movies and the users. Right, so and, and if of... in, in math, there's the concept of a matrix factorization. <clears throat> an SVD, for example, which is where you basically take a big matrix and turn it into a small narrow one and a small thin one and multiply the two together. This so is exactly what we're doing. Instead of having like how user 14 rated every single movie, we just have five numbers that represents it, which is pretty cool. Right. Um, so earlier, did you say that both the user features were random as mm -hmm. well as the... Yes. I guess I'm in trouble um, relating to you. I, I thought, you know, we usually we, we run something like gradient, gradient descent on uh, something has like inputs that you know, and here, what are the, what do you know besides what we the know, resulting ratings? That's what we know, the resulting it's, ratings. So, like, can you perhaps come up the wrong, like, you flip the feature for, um, I mean, Flip the feature for a movie and a user because if you're doing that multiplication, like how do you know which value goes with which? Uh, if we, if 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 some, if one of the numbers was in the wrong spot, 
our loss function would be less good, and therefore there would be a gradient from that from that weight to say you should make this weight a little higher or a little lower. So all the gradient descent's doing is saying, okay, for every weight, if we make it a little higher, does it get better? Or if we make it a little bit lower, does it get better? And then we keep making them a little bit higher and lower until we can't go any better. And we had to decide how to combine the weights. So we, th this was our architecture, right? So our architecture was, let's take a dot product of some assumed user feature and some assumed movie feature. And let's add, in the second case, some assumed bias term. Right? So we had to build an architecture. And we built the architecture using common sense, right? which was to say, this seems like a reasonable way of thinking about this. Now I'm going to show you a better architecture in a moment. In fact, we're running out of time, so let me jump into the better architecture. Um, so I wanted to point out that there is something new we're going to have to learn here, which is how do you start with a numeric user ID and look up to find what is their five element latent factor matrix. Now remember, when we have user IDs like one, two, and three, one way to specify them is using one hot encoding. Right? Zero, one, zero, 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 one. So one way to um, handle this situation, let's just make a bit more room here would be if this was our user matrix, it was one hot encoded, right? And then we had a, um, a factor matrix um, containing a whole bunch of random numbers. Uh, right? One way to do it would be to take a dot product or a matrix product of this and this. Right? And what that would do would be, for this one here, it would basically say, okay, let's multiply that by this. It would grab the first column of the matrix, and this here would grab the second column of the matrix, and this here would grab the third column of the matrix. So one way to do this in Keras would be to represent our user IDs as one hot encodings, and, in, and to create a our user, our user factor matrix just as a regular matrix like this and then take a matrix product. Um, that's horribly slow um, because if we have 10,000 users then this thing is 10,000 wide and that's a really big matrix multiplication when all we're actually doing is saying for user ID number one take the first column. For user ID number two, take the second column. For user ID number three, take the third column. And so Keras has something which does this for us, and it's called an embedding layer. An embedding is literally something which takes an integer as an input and looks up and grabs the corresponding column as output. So it's doing exactly what we're seeing in this spreadsheet. I have two questions. One, how do you deal with uh, missing values? So if a user has not rated a particular movie, um, that's no problem. So missing values are just ignored. So I just set if it's missing, I just set the loss to zero. All right. And then um, how do you break up a training and test set? Um, I broke up this training and test set uh, randomly by grabbing random numbers and saying are they greater or less than 80, a 0.8, and then split my ratings into two groups based on that. And you're choosing those from the ratings so that. It you have some ratings from all users, and you have some ratings for all movies. Yeah, they're just, I just grabbed them at random. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I was just clarifying. So um, here it is. Here's our dot product. Um, in Keras, we um, and there's one other thing. I'm going to stop using the sequential model in Keras and start using the functional model in Keras. I'll talk more about this next week, but you can look, read about it learning the week. There are two ways of creating models in Keras the sequential and the functional. They do similar things, but the functional is much more flexible, and it's going to be what we're going to need to use from now on. Okay, so this is going to look slightly unfamiliar, um, but the ideas are the same. So we create an input layer for a user, and then we say, now create an embedding layer for n users, which is 671, and we want to create how many latent factors. I decided not to create 5, but to create 50. Okay, and then I create 
a movie input, and then I create a movie embedding with 50 factors. And then I say, take the dot product of those, and that's our model. So now please compile the model, and now train it, taking the user ID and movie ID as input, the rating as the target, and run it for six epochs, and I get a 1.27 loss. This is with a um, RMSE loss. Um, notice that I'm not doing anything else clever, it's just that simple dot product. Right? That gets me to 1.27. Here's how I add the bias. I use exactly the same kind of embedding inputs as before, and I've encapsulated in a function. So my user and movie embeddings are the same. And then I create bias by simply creating an embedding with just a single output. And so then my new model is uh, do a dot product, and then add the user bias, and add the movie bias. And try fitting that. And it takes me to a validation loss of 1.1. How is that going? Well, there are lots of sites on the internet where you can find out um, uh, benchmarks for movie lens. And on the 100,000 data set, we're generally looking for RMSC of about 0.89. Um, here's some more. Best one here is 0.9. Again, oh, here we are, 0.89. Um, and for this one, RMSE, well, that's on the 1 million data set. Let's go to the 100,000. 100,000, RMSE, 1.9, Okay, so kind of high 0.89s, low 0.9s would be um, state of the art according to these benchmarks. So we're on the right track, but we're not there yet. So let's try something better. Let's create a neural net. And a neural net does the same thing. We create a movie embedding and a user embedding, again with 50 factors. And this time we don't take a dot product, we just concatenate the two vectors together. Stick one on the end of the other. And because we now have one big vector, we can create a neural net. Create a dense layer, add dropout, create an activation, compile it, and fit it. And after five epochs, we get something way better than state of the art. Right? So we couldn't find anything better than about 0.89. Right? And so like this whole um, notebook took me like half an hour to write, and so I don't claim to be a collaborative filtering expert, but I think it's pretty cool that these things that were written by people that like write collaborative filtering software for a li living, that's what these websites basically are coming from, are places that you know use like LensKit. So LensKit is a piece of software for recommender, for recommender systems. We have just killed their benchmark, uh, and it took us 10 seconds to train. Um, so I think that's pretty neat, and we're right on time, so we're going to take one last question before we go home. Um, so in neural net, why is it that the number of factors so low? Oh, actually, I thought it was an equal, not a comma. Never mind, we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now you can go home. So that was a very, very quick introduction to um, embeddings. Like, as per usual in this class, I kind of stick the new stuff in at the end, and say, go study it, right? So your job this week is to um, keep improving State Farm, uh, hopefully win the new fisheries competition. By the way, in the last half hour, I just created this little um, notebook in which I basically copied the dogs and cats redux competition into um, something which does it with the same thing with the fish data, and I quickly submitted a result. And uh, so we currently have one of us in 18th place, yay. Um, so hopefully you can beat that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, most importantly, download the movie lens data and uh, and have a play with that. And we'll talk more about embeddings next week. Thank you.